From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deck, and most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. This is a very special interview, folks. It's one we've been looking forward to for quite a while. If you are hearing today's show on the day it publishes, it is January 17th, the day that the U.S. and the world commemorates the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Uh, Based in Georgia, Dr. King's work left a fundamental mark on the fabric of American society and also inspired an ongoing fight for justice across the planet. As you know, his life met a tragic early end on April 4th, 1968, when he was assassinated. The ensuing investigation left Dr. King's supporters, friends, family, and a great deal of the American public skeptical. So now, More than 50 years after his death, people are still working to understand what actually happened. And that's what we're diving into today, but we're not diving in alone. We are joined with the journalist, author, podcaster, Bill Kleber, co-creator of the RFK Tapes. uh, And also, we're joined to speak with him about his newest project, the MLK Tapes, in which Bill applies his investigative acumen to the controversy and the ongoing questions surrounding the assassination of the legendary civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. Bill, thanks so much for joining us on air today. It's a pleasure to be here, Ben. Thank you. Now, one of the first questions that comes up in any of our research and preparation for these interviews is the question of inspiration and motivation on your part as the creator of this project. Folks may not be aware that you have also been the co-creator of the RFK Tapes podcast. And one of our first questions is, what inspired you to reinvestigate the story of that assassination? And in what ways did this project inspire you to begin unraveling the story of Dr. King? Well, we go back a ways if, if, if we're going in that direction. And it was 30 years ago that I joined a group of people who were uh, looking into the murder of Robert Kennedy and specifically looking at the police files that had just been released after 20 years of secrecy. I mean, Robert Kennedy was murdered. Uh, They said this guy did it, and yet their police files were off limits to everyone. And they finally were forced open in 1988. And I was with a group of people who started going through them, and we were shocked by what we were finding. And we understood right away why these files were secret because it was a record of the police misconduct, their fabrication of evidence, destruction of evidence, and coercion of witnesses. And I went in and visited, uh, interviewed Sirhan in prison. It was a difficult thing to do. Came out, and I wrote an article on what I had found. Or I wasn't the only one, but what we had found in the police files. And it was a terrific article, and no one, no one was interested. They just didn't want it. So I, I went back to upstate New York, uh, and thought, you know, I've got these tapes of the police threatening these witnesses, and, and and I just got this idea. I went to a little public radio station upstate New York, and we put together this one-hour documentary called The RFK Tapes, and we just put it out there, and it was picked up by 160 public radio stations across the country. I didn't even know there were 160 public radio stations. <laughs> and it was picked up picked up by that, and then the week after... The Time magazine came out with a full-page review of the documentary, and St. Martin's Press called me up and asked me to write a book. Now, that was all on a story that nobody wanted. And what's the takeaway from that? The takeaway from that is that if you can, there is great power if you can hear the actual witnesses' voices uh, as opposed to someone talking about the case. And that's what we had in the RFK tapes. So a few years ago, when I ran into uh, a a man who had spent decades investigating the murder of of Martin Luther King and had dozens and dozens of audio tapes, it it wasn't a great leap for me to think of doing a podcast. And that's how the MLK tapes got started. 
Yeah, let's let's really dive into that. I want to talk about the tastes themselves. Uh, the the person that you're you're referring to there is William Bill Pepper, and uh, he's somebody that you've been speaking with for quite a while now, and he is the person from from whom you've got all of these tapes that we're going to be hearing in the show. What was his involvement with Martin Luther King and with James Earl Ray? Just uh, tell us a little bit about that. That's an incredible story. Um, and Bill Pepper uh, was friends with Martin Luther King uh, during the last year of his life. He had gone to v- Vietnam. He had sent himself to Vietnam to see what was going on there. And uh, he came back uh, with photographs and s- stories of what he had seen. And it was shocking what he had seen because what we were doing over there with napalm and white phosphorus was not what we said we were doing. And he came back and nobody wanted his story. Nobody wanted his photographs. And finally, he shopped around and Ramparts Magazine stepped up and, and took his story and took his photographs. And Martin Luther King saw the article and saw the photographs and called him up and said, I want to, I want to, I want to see you. I want to talk to you. And the two of them met and uh, Pepper showed King what he had, and uh, Pepper said that King actually wept when he saw the photographs of the children that were burned, horribly, horribly burned. So they started a relationship, and Pepper was one of the influences why King had come out in the spring of 1967 uh, at Riverside Church and came out against the war in Vietnam. And uh, he and Pepper worked together the next year um, and then King was assassinated. And Pepper believed at first the same thing that everybody else did, that James L. Ray was the guy who killed King, and there wasn't really that much more to it. And uh, it was only a few years later when Ralph Abernathy, King's number two, called Pepper on the phone and said, I don't like what I'm hearing. I'm not believing what I'm hearing, and I'd like to go talk to this guy, Ray, myself. Would you come with me? And Pepper said, yeah, okay, I, I don't really know that much about the case. I need, to, I need to look into it a little. But they agreed to go, and that summer they went up to Brushy Mountain State Prison, sat down with James O'Ray, talked to him for five hours, and they each came away with the almost certain knowledge in their own minds that Ray had not shot King. So that started Bill's investigation into the murder of his friend. And he started going to Memphis and asking questions and talking to people. And once it became known that there was somebody interested, people started coming out of the woodwork. People started coming forward. This is what I saw. This is what I heard. And gradually the case uh, built up. But, you know, I mean, a lot of things happened between his investigation was 40 years long. Um, But uh, it's amazing how many people stepped forward, especially as they approached death. Um, People all of a sudden had pangs of conscience. People didn't want to die with the information they were holding, and they would come forward. And every time somebody came forward, he would sit them down, put them under oath, and record what they had to say. And that's the material that we have to work with on the MLK tapes. One of the questions that leads me to naturally, I think it's something a lot of people in the audience today will be wondering, is Bill, before you began working on this project, on this deep dive into the assassination, uh, what would you say was your your typical understanding going in? Like, did you accept the official conclusions of the U.S. government or did you have your own questions that you brought to the story? I was in law school when uh, Martin Luther King was shot, and uh, I at first thought that, I mean, there was a lot of crap going on in the 1960s, a lot of people getting shot, a lot of people getting killed, and it didn't matter how powerful they were, they were getting killed anyway. And um, so it wasn't a great leap to think that or something really underhanded happened with King. So that was my first thought. But then this guy, James O. Ray, was arrested. Uh, He eventually pled guilty to the crime, and like a lot of other people, I thought, well, that was that. Um, But the basic story was this guy was so, had so much hatred for black people and so much hatred for Martin Luther King that he escaped prison and then went out and searched for King and found him and killed him because he hated him so much. And that was, that was a very bogus story. But I, like a lot of people, believe it because there really wasn't anything else to 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 believe, but I had suspicions. But I, I just want to say that, you know, for a lot of people listening to this podcast, uh, 
Dr. King is, is sort of a, is an historical figure. He's like Abraham Lincoln. Well, he wasn't like Abraham Lincoln to me. I remember when he came to my college and he spoke, uh, and he, he stood up and he spoke. There were no notes. He just spoke from the heart, and he, he talked about how difficult the road was going to be going forward. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't going to be as easy as just getting a seat on the bus. It wasn't going to be as easy as getting a seat on the, on, on the lunch counter. And, and he was talking about uh, how he wanted to fight for economic justice, not just civil rights. He was moving away from civil rights. And he hadn't yet come out against the war, but that was just coming just in a few months from them. And I was also in New York City when uh, he spoke uh, just a couple of weeks after he gave the speech at um, uh, Riverside Church. And he spoke at the steps of the United Nations. And the man who introduced him at that rally, and there was more people than I'd ever seen in one place. It just as far as you could see, there were people. And the, the man who introduced him was Bill Pepper, uh, introduced him at that rally in New York City. And I don't remember what Pepper said, uh, that didn't register, but I do remember what Martin Luther King said. And you, you could hear his voice booming out, stop the bombing, stop the bombing, save our national honor and stop the bombing. So he was a real person to me. He wasn't just some, some historical somebody. I've had a lot of feelings because I came of age in the 1960s, and there's a lot of anger inside me because of what I saw happen and in looking into the murder of Robert Kennedy and, to a certain extent, John Kennedy has just made me mistrust a lot of things that were said to us back then. You know, I think it's easy to take for granted, like, how today we have access to so much information, like, literally at our fingertips, the whole of history, of music, of culture. Um, and so it's maybe a little easier to be distrustful and question these kind of narratives that, um, you know, get put forth. Uh, because, you know, now with the, you know, the benefit of hindsight, the story around James Earl Ray just stinks to high heaven. And just even just common sense kind of makes one feel with even a little bit of research that there's just something weird going on there. But why at the time do you think it was easier to swallow that story? Was it something that people just needed to put this to bed because it was so painful? Um, or was it just kind of like something that made sense, uh, you know, given that lack of, you know, what we have to work with today? I would say neither. Um, I think what it was, uh, well, first of all, James Ray was arrested in Great Britain. He was brought to the United States. Uh, he was then put in a cage um, for eight months that, where the lights were not turned off at all any time during the day. Uh, he was only allowed to see his brother and his lawyer. So he was kept incommunicado the whole time. And uh, when, he, you know, when they finally let him come out, uh, it was to make uh, a, a plea of guilty to the charges. So when, whenever I have a conversation with someone and I say, oh, I'm working on the Martin Luther King case, the common reaction is, well, the guy said he did it. What, what's the big deal? And that's what they were going for, because if they could get a plea of guilty out of him, they would never have to explain any of the rest of it. And so what we're trying to do in this podcast is we have a whole episode, I think it's number four, where we go into how that plea actually came about and how he was forced into it. And it's, it's a nasty, nasty story. But, you know, that's, that's what people will come back at you with. Well, he said he did it. And, you know, the answer is no. He always denied it. He always said he did not kill Martin Luther King from the first moment he said it to his last breath. But there is no reason to question it. For, for, for you, for someone that was even as close and you know, to, to him as a, as a person, uh, to King, or at least in terms of like, you know, a person you respected and saw, um, you know, speak uh, in real life, there was no, nothing in the back of your mind that made you at the time question it because of those reasons. Um, I wouldn't say nothing. I questioned a lot of stuff, but, uh, you know, there, there wasn't anything to hang your hat on. There wasn't anything to, that you could use to, to know. Um, and so I was suspicious. I just because it was Barry. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I want to get into this the the concept of the trial, and um, you know we we don't have to go too deep into it. But James Earl Ray was never given a proper trial by jury because he pled guilty. He attempted to appeal that plea. I think a few days later, right? Maybe three days later. Three days. And he was unable to to get that to happen. And there's some weird circumstance there, too. Uh, I've, I'll let you listen to the podcast to get some of that. But uh, some evidence did come forward in some, um, let's say, 
uh, some ways that you may not expect. And this was mind blowing to me. And I learned it through the creation of this, this podcast was that there was a 1993 mock trial of James Earl Ray that aired on HBO. I was 10 years old at the time. I had no idea this occurred. I've never seen footage of it until I was like forced to, because I was, you know, making this show with you (laughs) and it blew my mind to, to know that some evidence was actually put on trial in a mock way. uh, And, and people got to watch HBO and learn about it. Can you tell us a little bit about that mock trial and what happened? It was a, a great idea. It, it goes to the creativity of Bill Pepper and, and the energy he brought to this case. And he tried to get Ray a, a real trial. He appealed the case. He went to the state and he went to federal court and he went to a federal appeals court. And he finally went, went to the Supreme Court saying this man never got a trial. He was denied the trial he was entitled to. And he failed. He just couldn't get a, a trial for James L. Ray. And then the idea came to, he knew this producer in Great Britain who said, why don't we put one on, you know, and HBO signed on for it. And it was a big undertaking. They had um, a real federal judge, retired federal judge, um, overseeing the case and and using the laws of uh, um, the state of uh, Tennessee. And they had a real jury that was selected, impartial jury. And they had a U.S. prosecutor from Memphis, uh, Hickman Ewing, uh, on the other side. And they conducted the trial and put on the evidence and introduced the, the witnesses pretty much just as you would at a trial. James L. Ray also testified, and he was cross-examined by Hickman Ewing, who gave him a rough time, but uh, he just stuck with his, his story. But this was as close to a real trial as you could get. And, uh, you know, the, the jury decided that the, they didn't meet, meet the, the requirement of reasonable doubt, and they acquitted him, which, by the way, is what his original attorneys, who we might get to later, thought they were going to do in the first place after they took the case on. They thought the evidence against Ray was really thin, and what there was of it appeared to have been planted. So, I mean, anyway, the, this trial, this HBO trial, um, they, they got their first win, their first big win. Of course, nobody covered it. So, you know, uh, it wasn't it wasn't very well known. And this is uh, this is one of the things uh, th- there are so many questions I want to return to. But let's let's stay on this for a moment, because this is one of the things that I think uh, much of history conveniently forgot is uh the narrative that a lot of children in the U.S. are taught in school is inarguably sanitized in some ways, right? Or it at least focuses on some things and kind of glosses over others. And if you if you count the mock trial as at the very least the closest to a trial that Ray got, uh, it may surprise other people to know that the King family successfully won a civil suit in 1999. Uh, This suit, I believe, also, at least temporarily, uh, inspired the Department of Justice to reopen their investigation. Could you tell us a little bit about the civil suit, a little bit about how like the order of operations in which broke down in which it broke down and what that means uh, to the investigation as people perceive it today. I'm looking specifically for the finding where uh, they agreed it was a conspiracy. The, the civil trial in 99, gosh, how to exactly explain it? It was a terrific, a terrific idea because it was a way to use a civil suit to, to sue a uh, a person who they knew was involved in the murder, and then various unnamed government agencies in the murder of Martin Luther King. And, you know, they were only asking for $100 worth of damages. Uh, but what the whole purpose of it was that they could get, in the in the context of this trial, they could get all the witnesses that, that were still alive and that could testify, get them up and have them testify under oath in a court of law and have that testimony be part of that trial, and so where it would be accessible to, to history. And so that was that was the big takeaway there. And the fact that they won the case, I don't think means a whole lot, because there wasn't a lot of opposition on the other side. Um, they were only looking for a hundred bucks. Uh, it, to a certain extent, it wasn't as important an event as you might think it was in terms of the verdict. 
but in terms of the process, in terms of all the people who went and testified, in terms of the participation of the King family and what Coretta Scott King said after the trial, that's the importance of it. So sometimes people say, oh, well, there really wasn't anybody fighting on the other side, and that's the truth. And they could have made a bigger mess of things if there had been, but what it was was a way to get the evidence out in front, and they did that. And with that, we're going to take a quick moment to hear a word from our sponsor, but we'll be right back. And we've returned with Bill Claver. So I want to talk about the Department of Justice's reaction to that trial and to its conclusion. I'm going to read you a tiny little excerpt here from their website, justice.gov. Uh, they say, we recommend no further federal investigation of the Jowers allegations. The man's name is Lloyd Jowers, by the way, who was sued or any other allegations related to the assassination unless and until reliable, substantiating facts are presented. At this time, we are aware of no information to warrant any further investigation of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So they say that in response to everything that came forward during that civil trial, stuff that had occurred before, which, you know, became a part of the civil trial. Why do you, Bill think there is more to this case than the Justice Department does? Well, <laughs> they came to the same conclusion that the FBI came to the day after Martin Luther King was shot. They came to the same conclusion that House Select Committee on Assassinations came to, even though there were numerous examples of the, the House Select Committee stumbling on some piece of the truth and then all of a sudden realize they're in that situation and they make up another cockamamie story instead of saying, oh, oh, I see James Earl Ray uh, actually didn't have a racial motive and he didn't, wasn't driven by hate. Uh, do they then say, oh, maybe he didn't shoot King? No. They say, well, he probably did it to get a reward for the bounty of which there is no evidence at all. And th several different times they would come upon uh, something like that, that uh, Percy Foreman was a was a big liar, was another one of their conclusions, because uh, he went and testified and he just revealed himself as a, a, a total craphead. Uh, and they said nothing, nothing he said can be relied upon. Do they then think, oh, maybe this guy who pushed his way into the case, who's such a liar, maybe he was working for somebody else. No, they don't do that. They just shrug it off. Um, when they, when they, when they, they finally come to the, uh, the conclusion that uh, James Earl Ray going back and exchanging the rifle he bought for another rifle, they finally realize, oh my goodness, this is 10 years later. That probably means there was somebody else involved. Of course, that's what it means, dun, right? Dun. So, um, <laughs> and they, they come to that conclusion, but oh my goodness, that can't be, because that's what Ray said, uh, that, that can't be true. So the next best thing is, you know, it was probably his brother, and that keeps it all in the family. So they keep stumbling over these things that should be clues as to there's something else going on here, and they just make up another phony story. And so you, the same thing with the Justice Department. Their job was, you know, it gets handed down and handed down, and then, and then they, they go and they find every little reason to disbelieve every single witness. Oh, this guy lied to his seventh grade teacher about something or other. And so, you know, that was their job. Their job was to find, there was, you know, come out and say, there's nothing to worry about, folks. We've been, we've been back in there. We've looked at the evidence. Don't worry. There's nothing to see. That's what they're paid to do. And this, uh, this I think, could use a little uh, context for our audience today because at times concurrently, uh, concurrent with these investigations or with these shutdowns of investigations, the public was slowly learning about a government program called COINTELPRO. And it wasn't, uh, I believe, confirmed uh, for some time, at least officially until after King's death, that COINTELPRO, which was a, a surveillance and monitoring program on the part of Uncle Sam was actively monitoring and even harassing King and members of his family. Uh, was the DOJ or the FBI, were they motivated to perhaps go with their convenient narrative despite the contradictory facts because of knowledge of COINTELPRO? 
Or do, do you believe that played any role in their calculus there? I don't think that played a role in the calculus so much. I mean, when COINTELPRO came out, they were hor- everybody was horribly embarrassed. The church committee had hearings, and they were particularly outraged at how uh, this program was used on Dr. King. And um, so there was a lot of outrage about that. And, and uh, But um, if you follow it back, it's really hard to understand why – Hoover went after King in such a way. Um, here you had a, a, a black leader who had a, a lot of moral authority and who was standing up and telling people, yes, we want our rights, we want what is due to us, and we want to be we, we want to be nonviolent. We want to obey the law. We want, you know, he he was not preaching violence, and yet they were going after him like he was a great danger to the society. And it's it's and Hoover um, was pretending all the time that somehow King was falling under the, uh, the the control of communists, and that was the big reason that he had to have the right to wiretap King. And uh, it's a pretty sad story in in the states. Bobby Kennedy briefly gave him the right to wiretap for one month, and that was supposed to be uh, you know if see if you can come up with any you know information communist information for one month, and then. Mar- uh, John Kennedy was then murdered uh, right after that, and any control that Bobby Kennedy had over Hoover instantly evaporated. And Hoover, uh, within a month, held a big meeting in Washington that Kennedy didn't know about, where they, all they did was discuss different ways they could bring down Martin Luther King. And that's a matter of record. I listen every once in a while, I'll, I'll just to refresh my soul on this thing. I'll listen to a speech that King gave one place or another. Um, and the other day, I, I just listened to the, the, the entire Riverside Church speech uh, on Vietnam. And I, I would recommend to anybody, if you want to know about Martin Luther King, you want to know about his character, you want to know about his courage, you listen to that speech because he's standing up. He's the first major public figure to stand up and say, this is wrong. And he knows when he does it, he knows when he does it, it's going to mean the money is going to dry up on his end and he's going to make big enemies. And he still, he stands up and said, this is wrong to be doing what we're doing there. And, you know, you listen to a a tape like that and then hear these people bringing forward little stuff to, to assassinate his character. It makes me sick. And just to remind everybody, that speech was given exactly one year to the day before he was assassinated. Exactly one year to the day. And following that speech, that's when he was called a communist by newspapers and, you know, prominent media figures. So just keep that in context. I I think it's like most of us can tell the difference between rhetoric and political posturing and what Dr. King did. I mean, when you hear him speak, it has a magic to it. There's there's an absolute, you know, uh, level of charisma that is outside of the charisma of a politician, you know, or someone who is trying to kind of twist the screw and make people behave as they want to. This is a man that put himself in harm's way, that put himself, his reputation, you know, uh, it, out there in a way where people could besmirch him at every turn, uh, and he didn't care. And so when you hear him make these speeches, they are absolutely the real deal. I mean, Whatever you may think, I think that comes through. And I think it's interesting when you're t- – we're, we're getting towards kind of the intent. Like what – why assassinate Martin Luther King? Yes, he represented a, a movement, of course, and he was the fifth face of this movement. But the problems that, that, that led to the movement being necessary pre-exist, you know, the movement. Uh, and, and, and you can't really – get rid of that problem or the people's discontentment by killing a man. You know, if anything, it's going to make them angrier. And I heard someone uh, in, in commenting on, on this um, tragic event of, of his passing that he they didn't realize that, that he was the, the white man's biggest advocate <laughs> in terms of, you know, keeping these riots from destroying, you know, society and, and from being out there and, and, and preaching nonviolence and things like that. Can you kind of speak to that side of Dr. King and how maybe the people that were trying to assassinate his character, let alone him physically, maybe missed the point, missed that uh, that whole idea that he really was kind of there to help them? It's a little hard to understand. I, uh, it, you know, Hoover is a big part of this equation. He's not the only piece, um, but 
Hoover had some sort of hatred towards King that is a little bit unexplainable. I think he was a little jealous. I think he was jealous of King and didn't like the attention he was getting. Um, and he liked being the guy that was pushing all the pieces around. And he was used to getting his way because he had secret files on everybody. And he had a lot of files on John F. Kennedy. Uh, and one of the reasons that Bobby Kennedy ended up agreeing to the limited wiretapping thing that Hoover so badly wanted was that Hoover had just gotten Kennedy out of another one of his sexual escapades scrapes with uh, Ellen Ramesh, who was thought to maybe be connected to East German intelligence. And uh, so after Hoover uh, rescued Kennedy in his presidency, that might have gone down because they were going to have congressional hearings on this thing. And Hoover then met with the heads of Congress and the Senate and saying, oh, this is going to, you know, blow up in everybody's face and we can't do this and a lot of that. And he got Kennedy out of it. And then he went back to Bobby and said, well, you know, do I get my wiretaps? And at that point, um, you know, Bobby said, yeah, okay, you know, for a month or whatever, if you really think you can dig up stuff. And they often said, oh, Bobby Kennedy was the one who, who decided to wiretap King. It's not true. He consented because it, basically their hand was forced and they owed it to Hoover, who not only got him out of that trouble, but got him other, out of other sexual trouble that he'd gotten himself into. A quid pro quo, it appears. Uh, this might surprise uh, many people to learn that those kind of deals, unofficial but impactful, can occur, and they often occur outside of the public sphere. They're things that the public will learn about in retrospect. And when we're talking about murkiness, Bill, um, one thing that really stands out to me in episode three specifically, we were fortunate enough to get a sneak peek, uh, is just the sheer the sheer profundity of murkiness that is involved in this story of James Earl Ray and i think this gave i think this um gave a lot of red meat to people who were initially claiming there was a cover up or corruption involved and i i'd love to hear you talk about some things that really stood out to me in your conversations in episode 3 uh wherein we, we already talked about how uh, Ray never actually went to a jury trial. He very early on recanted his guilty plea, but he also managed to escape from incarceration, never spoke about who may have assisted him. And despite the fact that he was known to be a petty criminal, uh, our understanding is that he was also found with some pretty good fake identification at one point. Uh, how... Also, you know, let's just throw this out here uh, and emphasize this again. The guy was arrested in Great Britain. How does a petty criminal who actually doesn't sound like they're that great at petty crime, how does a petty criminal manage to achieve all of these things, to escape from incarceration, to have uh, actionable like I'll say it, maybe pro-level fake IDs. And then how does he get across the pond? Are there any answers to these questions? Well, you know, we're going to be called conspiracy theorists anyway. So, um, <laughs> I, you know, and I don't think of myself as conspiracy theorist. I, I, you know, I'm not a conspiracy guy. I'm an evidence guy. But, uh, but in, there are some places where you need to just sort of uh, uh, apply theory to it. And um, I think his escape from prison is one of them. There is evidence. Ronnie Lee Atkins claims that he and his father drove out to Missouri with $25,000 and gave it to the prison warden uh, in exchange for the release of James Earl Ray. And the, the idea was that they were looking for some... You know, and it may, they may have had other ideas of other people they wanted to use, but they were looking for someone they could use to be a fall guy, and they thought this guy Ray was perfect for them. And so they uh, allowed him to escape, arranged for him to escape in this bread truck, and then they just kept tabs on, tabs on him as he traveled around in Canada and other places and then kind of directed him here or there. You know, it may be that at one point they, he was sent down to Birmingham and then nothing happened. There might have been some plot to kill King in Birmingham. Uh, he was out in Los Angeles for a long time. They say he stalked 
uh, King. He didn't stalk King. He was out in Los Angeles. King came to Los Angeles. But the thing with Ray is that he would never rat on anybody who helped him. So whether it was whoever helped him escape from prison, he, th this was his culture. He had spent almost his entire adult life in prison. And one of the things he learned is that you just don't rat out anybody. And, uh, and he wouldn't. Y yes, he had uh, fake identities of people uh, that he could never have gotten on his own. He had to have had help. He had to have help uh, escaping from prison. He could not have made that escape on his own. He had to have help and probably permission. Um, so, it, it, you know, there are places where he just will not tell, even to Bill Pepper, various things. He met with people in New Orleans. He says he met with Raul in New Orleans. It might have been more people than that. Maybe Carlos Marcello was in the room. But what good does it do him to, to say that? Uh, because that'll only assure he gets killed in prison. So it may be that it's a more complicated story than he's been willing to uh, to let on. Um, but he knows that, you know, if he, he starts saying, well, there were these mob guys in New Orleans that I met, it, it will be the end for him. So I don't know. That's just an idea I have in my head. But uh, he's He's a strange character, and I don't believe he shot Martin Luther King. I don't believe he knew Martin Luther King was going to be shot. I don't think that everything he told Bill Pepper is necessarily the truth. Yes, and you've had similar conversations in the course of the MLK tapes. And in some of these conversations, you mentioned something that I want to go back to. It's a character uh, that may not be familiar to people with a uh, cursory knowledge of the assassination ensuing investigations, a guy named Raul, who apparently appears in, in, as kind of a cameo and then somehow vanishes from history. So can you introduce our audience to Raul, or at least the story of this person? Sure. Raul was the person that Ray said he met in Canada and who he started to go to work for, smuggling, doing small smuggling jobs across the border, and then, then going south, and Raul gave him enough money to buy a Mustang, and then they did some small smuggling jobs in Mexico. And Raul was the one who, um, according to Ray, who, who told him to go buy a rifle in Birmingham, and then when he came back with the rifle, said it was the wrong rifle, and he had to go back and exchange it for an, another gun. So Raul is that character... When Ray tells his story, when he's arrested, he tells his story to Bradford Huey and um, where he went in Canada and who he met and where he worked and, and all these things. And Huey was able to substantiate almost all of it. Um, you know, where he worked at the Indian Trail restaurant and Huey goes up and talks to those people and said, he was, he was really a gentleman. He was, he was the sweetest guy. He did his work. Um, you know, we saw no evidence of this burning hatred inside this man. But the one person, the only person they can't locate is Raul. But that's not surprising because they didn't know his last name. They didn't know where he lived. They didn't know if Raul was even his correct first name. And Raul certainly didn't want to be located. So it was, it's, a, it's a little difficult to to find this Raul, except we think we, we may have in the podcast. And, and uh, you know, stick with us because, you know, there's a certain point where a woman shows up and said, I knew a Raul back in the day, and he kind of acted like he had done something with um, Martin Luther King. And uh, so that's one whole episode we have, and it's it's a crazy story. Yeah, there's connections that you wouldn't expect. Like, it's... it. I, I just so you know, and so you guys know, I thought Raul was made up. I was like convinced that Raul was made up until I heard some of the stuff that we're going to hear in this, this episode. Spoilers, man. But I mean, <laughs> the, the, the James Earl Ray was a notoriously like bad liar and not particularly bright, right? I mean, I'm not, not to <laughs> character assassinate this guy, but like, I mean, it's pretty clear. Like he didn't really know much about guns. He went in and kind of like bought whatever gun the gun owner, gun store guy told him to and then came back and returned it. And that was suspicious, all at the behest of this guy, Raul. Um, but then, you know, your Raul kind of ends up being an inconvenient lead 
if you can't really trace him down, it's easier to wrap it all up in Ray, who's like your bird in the hand, rather than like go chase this mythical, you know, uh, bird in the bush. But I still don't understand the intent. If Raul represented some sort of shadowy group that was trying to assassinate uh, MLK, is it some kind of anarchist bent, like this, like to cause a race war, or like, like what, what, what? In your opinion, based on everything that you know. Would the intent be behind such an assassination? I think there was a mistrust and a, a hatred towards King that was shared by a number of powerful groups, including the National Police Force under J. Edgar Hoover, including organized crime under Carlos Marcello, and uh, uh, police organizations uh, uh, particularly uh, were not fond of this this guy who was shaking, especially in the South where uh, you know, the garbage men were on strike and, and King was the guy that was, you know, doing all this rabble rousing. There was a very large collection of people who felt a burning hatred towards King. And not only that, and, and I think this is the, the clincher, is that there was a great deal of money being made in the war in Vietnam. And there were a lot of people invested in that. And then King was the one who was coming out and saying this was wrong. And uh, it was starting to work its way down into the troops and their black troops were starting not to obey their officers. There were cases of fragging. Um, and there were people who very much to their inner soul believed that Martin Luther King was a traitor to this nation. They believed that. And when you believe that someone is a traitor to the nation and you have the power to kill them, you just might do it. And I think that's where, I think that's where all this leads. The greater good argument, right? tale as old as time, unfortunately. Uh, there is just just a, a housekeeping note for anyone unfamiliar with the term. Uh, fragging, it would, could you tell us just a little bit about what fragging was during the Vietnam War? It was a way that common soldiers could get back at officers who they didn't like or who had done things to them uh, in one way or another. And you're in a firefight uh, somewhere and your officer is up there and you've got a gun and you're shooting a gun and you just happen to shoot the officer you don't like. Uh, and there were, I, I don't know how many documented cases of that there were, but there, it, it was enough. I mean, it did happen. Uh, so, and, and there were, you know, when the, the racial thing got in, you know, introduced and when Martin Luther King was saying, what are you doing there? And all of a sudden these young black men sort of woke up and realizing, I'm fighting the white man's war. Why am I here? Why am I fighting for the rights of Vietnamese when I don't even have rights back in Georgia, when I don't have rights in Chicago, you know? And so there was that whole line. And I personally think that that was probably the strongest reason behind the murder of King. But it involved a lot of different people who were happy to look the other way. They, whoever pulled it off knew that they could do so without any trouble from the FBI. You know, it's a group effort. Yeah, group effort. Just so even if even if the FBI or factions thereof were not directly involved, uh, the picture that is painted, and an accurate picture, I would argue, is one of a a large number or a small number of large powerful interests who wouldn't be heartbroken if this threat to the status quo was to be taken off the board. Uh, would you agree with that estimation? If not conspiracy of multiple players, would you agree that uh, there were many institutions in the mix who were just happy to have him gone? Well, yes. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I think that's, that's true. And the same could be said for uh, John Kennedy, and the same could be said for Bobby Kennedy, that there were enough people that were happy to have them gone, that uh, they could put a phony Warren Commission together and, uh, you know, to cover up what, I mean, the evidence of conspiracy in the John Kennedy, and I know we're going a little off, you know, topic here, but uh, the evidence of, of conspiracy there is like, you, you know, you, you go into an apartment that's been burglarized, and you walk in and, you know, it's underwear all over the room. The whole place is a mess. You know that you've been burglarized. Well, that's what the murder of John Kennedy was like. The evidence of it is all over the place. Uh, it got a little neater when it came to Martin Luther King and Bobby. But, uh, the, uh, yes, there were a lot of people who could be relied upon not to make trouble. They weren't necessarily involved, 
but you knew that they weren't going to make up trouble for you. That meant a lot of different things could happen. And a lot of different things did happen. Okay, we're going to take a quick pause to hear a word from our sponsor, and then we'll be back with more from Bill. And we've returned. Bill, I want to just talk a little bit about some of the people you created new interviews with for this show. So this isn't, you know, just archival tapes that, that are being presented. You you spoke to people who were there. You spoke to people who are still living, uh, who have stories to tell. And in episode two, you speak with Reverend James Lawson. And I just want to hear in your words, uh, what are some of the strange things that occurred right before Martin Luther King was assassinated? I talked to Reverend Lawson. He is one of the giants in the civil rights movement. He would, you know, John Lewis, we lost this year. Uh, Reverend Lawson was the mentor for John Lewis. Uh, and he organized the lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville. And he was one of the founders of SNCC. Uh, and I mean, he's a, and he was a good friend of Martin Luther King. Uh, and he was the one who brought King to Memphis to help with the sanitation strike. And he was there. And when after King was killed, he went around uh, the, the city trying to calm the, the, the black populations because he just didn't want to see more riots. And also, he, he got uh, three days after King was killed, uh, he got a package in the mail that had a bullet taped to a card that said, we have one of these for you too, N-word preacher. I assume that James O. Ray, on his flight to Canada or something, didn't have time to uh, send a bullet to James Lawson. But, uh, yeah, when I talked to Lawson, uh, he spoke of a number of things that, that uh, really bothered him that he noticed uh, either before the murder or after the murder. And, uh, you know, one of them was that there were two firemen uh, in the firehouse across the street from the Lorraine Motel, those two firemen were told the day before the murder to report to uh, different uh, fire stations. Um, and w- so they were gone. Um, there was uh, uh, there was Ed Reddit, who was a, a police uh, detective uh, who was surveilling uh, King at uh, Lorraine. It wasn't a nice job. It wasn't that he was protecting King. He was just keeping a list of who was coming and going. And he, it was his job because he was black and he knew who those people were. So that's why he was doing it. Two hours before the murder, he is told uh, to go home, ordered to go home on on a trumped up charge. The the thing I think uh, Lawson was most angry about was uh, that when King came to the city and other times, he had an all black police security unit assigned to him, uh, eight or nine man unit who guarded him day and night. And for some reason, on his last visit, that unit was not called the form. And we have uh, Captain Jerry Williams on tape telling us that, you know, that that last time he came in, I don't know why, but we weren't told to to form. And so King was stripped of his black security guard. There was briefly a four-man white, all-white security guard uh, sent to the Lorraine, but they went home at five o'clock, weren't replaced, and they didn't come back the next day, which was the day King was killed. Now, all that stuff doesn't prove that, that you know, King was killed by a conspiracy, but it don't look good. Um, and, uh, you know, and if it was table setting for a murder, uh, then the finger of guilt has to point back to the people with the power to make those things happen. I mean, it's just as simple as that. So, um, and, and there were a bunch of things. Um uh, there was Carthel Whedon, who was the head of the uh, the firehouse, who testified later on that that day a pair of guys with fancy IDs, flashing army IDs, asked to have access to the roof of the firehouse. And Whedon brought them up to the roof of the firehouse and let them go there. And he was pretty sure they didn't have rifles, but what they did have with them was photographic equipment. And they were there photographing the Lorraine Hotel Motel and the the environs around there on what just happened to be the day that Martin Luther King was shot, you know? And Bill Pepper's theory is that they were photographing that. So if, and looking at the photographs, if they saw anybody who saw something that they didn't want seen, um, they would know, um, you know, who it was. Uh, and they would have a record. 
So, but anyway, those people have never come forward. They never came forward and say, oh yeah, we were the photographers that day, um, which, you know, is, is, is highly suspicious. So th there was a lot of stuff. Um, and it certainly couldn't be James Earl Ray arranging these things because he just, he just drifts into town in the middle of the afternoon and somehow at six o'clock he's able to pull off this elaborate murder. These are just exercises in scratching the surface of the problems with the official story. And there is exclusivity in the MLK tapes. We're learning in this journey that you're taking us on, Bill, we're learning not just the existing discrepancies that people have been aware of in some cases for decades, but we're learning new information along the way. And this is something, you know, Matt, you said just as much when you said, you know, I thought Raul was made up and candidly um, for a long time, I thought the same because there is a, um, you know, we don't want to spoil too much, but there, there are moments where it seems that because James Earl Ray is an unreliable narrator at times, a lot of what he says has to necessarily be scrutinized. Um, and with this idea of scrutiny, I have I have one big question that I'd love to hear the answer for in your own words, Bill. What does the MLK tapes, what does this investigation and the events that it covers, what do they teach us in the modern day? What are lessons people can take away from this I this assassination that, you know, honestly, many, many people in the U.S. consider unsolved today. Well, you know, there's a song in Porgy and Bess by Gershwin. It's, uh, it ain't necessarily so. And the things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. And uh, I would say that's the takeaway, um, that uh, it's important to look behind, to pay attention to the details when things happen. And, you know, if if you're going to be fooled by the things that they just sort of throw out there for you, uh, you know, you're going to be fooled a lot of times. So, um, you know, just be on guard. And, you know, especially with the Internet these days, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that isn't true. And it's, uh, you know, it can be hard to, to, you know, pick through it and know what's real and what isn't. I, I was going to ask if you do you have any advice on that realm? Because that's really what we try on try and do on the show is sift through the stuff, you know, the actual small truths that exist within the noise. Uh, but you've been doing this for a long time, Bill. Is, is there any trick to it? No, there's no trick to it. Um, there's, <laughs> in fact, uh, I'm not very good at it because uh, this whole internet thing is, you know, brand new to me. When I, I was growing up and you want to make a telephone call, you didn't dial, you didn't punch any numbers. You just told the operator the number you wanted to call. But, but, but I think what Matt's asking too is like beyond the technology, I mean, it's about sort of like a frame of mind, like uh, when you're approaching these types of stories. Like, is there anything that you have learned over the years as to how to kind of clear your mind so that you can not be influenced by all the noise? Or is it just something that kind of you learn just through experience? There's a role for common sense to play. And you guys were relating to it before. You're just saying, geez, this guy. Ray, you know, he's a bungler and all this stuff. And somehow, and, and that was, I was, you know, I, I mentioned before that I listened to King's speech of, uh, at the Riverside Church on Vietnam. And it was so powerful and so intelligent, so with such moral authority. And then I thought, and this bumbler James Earl Ray was the one who killed him? It, it, you know, those things just didn't go together. It's like, no, he was killed for an important reason, and the important reason was the power of his words. And it wasn't because some guy that grew up in southern Indiana just hated black people so much that he had to kill King. So I guess, I, I guess the answer to that, your question, is um, some amount of common sense uh, it goes a long way. Wouldn't you say, though, there oftentimes isn't a profound reason that important people are killed? I mean, like, look at John Lennon. He was killed by a crazed fan, you know, I mean, or sometimes people just get killed by crazy people. You know, I mean, I understand in this situation. I do not think that's what's happening. But how do you kind of reconcile those things and, and not be influenced, um, you know, or, or not be overly looking for profoundness where maybe none exists in other types of cases, maybe? 
Oh, well, I'm not so sure that John Lennon wasn't murdered uh, by someone other than just a crazy guy. And the same thing with Allard Lowenstein, uh, who was a congressman in New York and who was looking into the Bobby Kennedy murder. And, and some guy shows up and, and shoots him. Uh, and, you, you know, I worked enough in the Serhan case uh, that um, they were – there were people at that time, it's, it, it, there were federal programs where they were looking how to create robot assassins. It's, it, it's known. It's, it, it did happen, MK Ultra, And uh, so, you know, if you can you know, work on people and, and mess around with their mind enough to, okay, you know, you, you're going to go shoot John Lennon. Um, that, and John Lennon was not a popular guy for the official people. They were trying to get rid of him for years. Um, so, uh, I don't know what happened there. I have no special knowledge of that, but, uh, I, when something happens like that, I don't automatically think, oh, it's just some crazy guy because we have too many murders by just some crazy guy. Um, and from what I know, you know, a bunch of them, they're phony official stories. Yeah, and we've already we've already thrown out a, a couple of things that are going to send people down a rabbit hole today. Uh, Dennis Sweeney, who was the uh, who was the trigger yep. man, right? Yep. Lowenstein, uh, Sirhan Sirhan, as we've mentioned earlier, is also technically up for parole uh, as we record today. Uh, history continues even after the headlines have left the newspapers and the and the evening news and that's one of the things that is crucial to remember and bill again we want to thank you so much not just for your time with us and stuff they want you to know today but perhaps more importantly uh, for the time and the energy that you have put in to the MLK tapes. Uh, Peek behind the curtains, folks. Uh, Matt is an EP on this project. Noel and I do not have secret access. We got a little bit of a sneak peek, but we are on the journey with you. And so uh, as as colleagues and, and listeners and fans of the show, Bill, uh, we're hoping maybe you could just give us a quick laundry list of some of the other characters that people will meet in the course of the MLK tapes. Oh, golly gee. Um, <laughs> you know, one of my favorites is just coming up, and that's Art Haynes Jr., who was uh, uh, James L. Ray's uh, first attorney, along with his father. A smart guy, a really, really, really smart guy. He went to Princeton, graduated from law school, and he's out of law school for two months, and all of a sudden he is representing the man accused of killing Martin Luther King. I mean, his head must have been spinning. But... Uh, 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 he he just gave us a, a really great interview in Birmingham, and he's still still practicing law to this day. And uh, he's a he's a man of great conscience, and he 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 was a judge in Alabama he's, uh, for twenty years, and he was appointed by George Wallace. He is not a, a flaming liberal by any means, and not at all. But he loves the law, and he loves the truth. He respects the truth, and he's not afraid to speak out about what he saw. Uh, as James O. Ray's attorney and what he discovered. Uh, and so, uh, and he's got a great sense of humor and he tells a really good story. So there's a bunch of funny stories that he tells that I love. Anyway, um, he's, he's one of the people that uh, is coming up. Uh, we've got Judge Joe Brown, who had his own TV show for 15 or 16 years. Um, but before he was a TV judge, he was a real judge in, in uh, Tennessee. And Pepper's attempt to open, reopen the, the James L. Ray case uh, landed in his courtroom, and it bounced around there for a year and a half or two years. Uh, it was a very messy thing, but Joe Brown is a ballistics expert, a gun expert, a gun lover, and he had a chance to look at the case and, and examine the gun and the evidence around the gun, the ballistics and the bullets, and he he is utterly convinced that the throwdown weapon, the weapon that had Ray's fingerprints on it, was not the murder weapon. Um, and he's a funny guy. I mean, he's he's got a great sense of humor also and tells wonderful stories about what it was like to be black in the legal system in the early days in Memphis. So there's there's Joe Brown. Gosh, it, it, it goes on. There's Glenda Grabo that comes along and tells an incredible story about Raul. 
And the thing about that story that I love the most is that she also ended up working for Percy Foreman, Ray's uh, so-called attorney, who also apparently knew Raoul. Uh, I mean, that's bizarre as can be. Uh, and I think that's I enough, know. Bill. We don't want to give too much away. But that's, right. yes, that's, mm-hmm, that's okay. coming. <laughs> And with that, we are drawing today's interview to a close. The MLK tapes are available as you listen to today's episode, wherever you find your favorite shows. And for more information, please do check out the MLKtapes.com. Once again, thank you so much for your time, Bill Kleber. Uh, We cannot wait to see how this story unfolds. And we, along with the rest of the audience except maybe Matt, right, Noel, are listening along with you. (laughs) Oh, I'm listening too. Don't worry. (laughs) Matt's always listening. (laughs) Thanks, guys. It's been been a real pleasure uh, being here. Uh, I've I've had fun. What do you think, fellow conspiracy realists? Do you like a uh, dwindling number of people in the U.S. today, believe the official narrative behind the MLK assassination? Or do you think there are more questions? We'd love to hear your thoughts. We try to be easy to find online. Catch us on the Internet. We are available in the usual places of note, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, we exist there under the handle at Conspiracy Stuff Show. If you'd like to find us on Instagram, you can find us at Conspiracy Stuff. If you'd like to find us on Instagram, you can find us at Conspiracy Stuff Show. Or give us a telephone call. That's right. Use your phone for its intended purpose. Call 1 833 STDWYTK. You can give yourself a cool nickname. Leave a message. We've started saving your nicknames in our system, by the way. So every time more broccoli calls, we know. Uh, (laughs) Add your name to the list. That's what I'm saying. If you've got three minutes, say whatever you wish. If three minutes is not enough time, instead, consider sending us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.